Good evening. Welcome to the February 23rd Constituent Meeting for the Fairfield District. I'm honored that as many persons who are able to attend our virtual constituent meeting that you are here with us. Thank you so very much. Uh, again, we're having a virtual meeting simply because we're very sensitive about health. And uh, many people are calling asking me, well, Ms. Thorne, when will we go back to meeting in person? Uh, we're going to wait a little longer till <clears throat> more people feel well about it. So thank you this evening for attending. And as I used to tell um, all the members who attend my meetings, we really don't do this for entertainment, but um, the thesis for the Fairfield constituent meeting is to share information about the county in which you, the citizens, live, so that with that information, you can make better decisions for you and your family. And I would love to live in a district like that so that I could know what's going to happen and sometime before it happens. And then just good general information that a citizen needs. And this particular evening, we're going to approach three topics for you. And um, I know you're going to enjoy them. And for our first topic, uh, it is called Meeting the Needs and Challenges of Recreation in the 21st Century. And this is going to be a little different from talking about, you know, how much the county is going to fund necessarily for any particular project or initiative. And we are happy to have with us Mr. John Zanino, who is the Assistant Director, Assistant Division Director for Recreation Services. John Zanino serves as the department's, listen to this now, very important skill and job he has as accreditation manager, as well oversees the animal care section, history section, marketing section, performing arts section, and special events section. So we are honored to have John with us to share about this topic this evening. And he has been with the county for 15 years. John, we're happy to have you. All thank, yours. Thank you, Mr. Thornton. So uh, this evening, I've got a presentation for you to talk about some national trends in the recreation industry, um, how COVID has affected that, and then also looking at some of our local trends and then what we do with that information and how we use those trends to um, decide what programs and what we offer you as a citizens. So I'm going to start with some of the national trends. Um, so the, the average work week that Americans work each year is becoming less and less. In 2020, the average week was a 34 and a half hour week. Um, and this, this data is coming from the US uh, Department of Labor, a survey they did. They do a time use survey every five years, and this was their 2020 survey. The other thing that we saw that was significant is a significant increase in the amount of individuals that telework. 42% uh, of the country in 2020 went to teleworking. Um, obviously, the pandemic drove that, but the, the data is showing that a larger percentage will continue teleworking and will continue that model and we will not go back to pre-COVID numbers. It will probably dip to some degree, but we're going to see a larger percentage teleworking. And that kind of comes into the recreation world because there's more time with individuals spent at home. There's more time for individuals spent with recreating, and it's also more time that individuals are spent alone. Um, you'll see seven hours a day an individual would spend alone, and if you were 55 plus, that is eight hours per day. So we look at that in our industry to say, we've got people who have more time and a greater demand for recreation and leisure activities. You also see that, as I just said, that over the past um, several years, there are more time spent on leisure. So if you can see both men, women, and combined are spending about half an hour more 
a day on leisure activities than they did five years ago when they did the survey in 2015. So men are spending almost six hours a day on a leisure activity, women a little bit less, um, at about almost an hour less, but the combined rate for both um, men and women, both demographics is increasing. This chart will kind of give you depicts what people are spending their time on. Um, no surprise, the vast majority of leisure time is spent watching TV. Um, actually about three hours a day um, is spent watching TV. Um, that number has gone up in the last five years. Um, COVID had probably something to do with that. Um, the other area that increased more significantly is the time people are using on devices, computers, cell phones, doing games. So those two categories increased the most over the last five years. Um, the one category that went down is the amount of times people are spending socializing and communicating. And we believe COVID probably had a large impact on that category. This chart um, kind of gives you some local data on what people are actually spending their time doing. So this compares Henrico versus the region and also the nation. So when you see that, that line that says MPI, that's a market potential index. If that was a hundred, that would mean we were on average with the nation. All of our categories are above the national average and are on par with the region and the region we defined as any of the localities that are neighboring to Henrico. So you can see we are above national average on physical activities and activities that are outdoors or exercise in nature. This next slide will go into kind of general leisure activities in terms of things people do outside, backpacking, canoeing, going to the zoo, the beach. And again, you'll see that in Henrico, the average is above the national average and on par in the, the Richmond region. So now kind of looking at what we've seen locally, and although the pandemic shut a lot of things down, our park visitation has never been higher. We have seen increases, particularly from um, 2020 to 2021, significant increases in every part that we are measuring um, has seen an increase. And this next slide will show the overall increase in park visitation. So we last year, last fiscal year, had almost 5 million individuals. It was 4.8 million individuals visit one of the 14 parks that we were tracking. Now we are currently track, we're adding more parks that we track, so we're adding more data. And the trend is, more and more people are getting out and using our facilities. They're using our parks. They may not be able to do activities, but they're getting out. They're enjoying nature. They're enjoying the parks. And that is the biggest increase we've seen um, since I've been here in 15 years. And you can see from this, the biggest increase was from 20 to um, 21. And we're continuing to see that increase this year. So that kind of is a broad topic on the adult population. Now I want to dive into kind of youth sports on a national level, youth sports on a local level, and then we'll get into some of the things that we're doing based on all this data. So youth sports nationally, um, COVID had a large impact. You can see that first bullet, 44% of families said that because of COVID, their sports, youth sports programs, and these were rec programs, not travel programs, um, either closed, merged with another organization, or returned with limited capacities. Um, so that's a big, significant in, uh, decline since COVID and how youth sports have returned. Um, another thing is they're seeing that wealth is still playing a factor in that. Um, and the individuals in a higher income bracket were less likely to have impacts and people in lower in income brackets were more severely impacted. So we are using that to, to kind of dictate what we, what we do. So these are national, um, national trends. And that data came from the state of play, which is a, 
a publication that comes out every year that measures the state and what sports are popular, what's the trends year over year and in the sports and the youth sports industry. Locally, what we have saw is some of the organized sports um, saw declining numbers. We did see some of our youth football association decline. Some of our groups merged. Um, that Laurel Recreation, we saw the the, the youth sport um, football merge there. We've seen declining numbers in um, soccer and in baseball. Um, we have seen some increased number in. Um, some new sports, we saw some increase in rugby and lacrosse. Um, sand volleyball saw a, a large increase. Uh, we're attributing that a lot to the sand quartzotic lover. Um, but the biggest trend that we're seeing locally is rec sports are declining while travel sports are increasing. There is more demand for specialized and travel sports and camps and clinics and showcases and for used as recruiting tools for college scholarships, but the rec sports are declining in numbers. Um, one positive that we were able to take away is although youth sports are declining, physical act inactivity of children is also gone down. So although they're not participating as much in organized sports, what they are doing is they are still getting out, which is what we're seeing in our park visitation numbers. And so it is good that they are getting out. It's just not necessarily in the organized um, sports. The national trend was a lot of the individualized sports were seeing increases, things where they didn't have to um, be in large groups, things they could do on their own. So that was some of the trends we were seeing in the youth sports and children activities. So the last slide is really, what are we doing um, with these trends? And what we as a department had focused on during COVID was we early on saw the increase in our park visitation and decided to put a large emphasis on promoting and advertising the parks and the amenities that we had. So in 2020, we took that year as an opportunity to develop a mobile application, also kind of leveraging that, um, that demand that people are using technology more. So we de developed and launched a mobile app. Um, so any of you who haven't downloaded, I would encourage you to download it. We launched this app in December of last year. And this app um, really has, it's a holistic view of everything we do. There's a park tab that has every park that we have in it, every amenity, every shelter, every playground, um, every, every little cool nuance that we have, historical features, rec centers, splash pads, dog parks, all of those amenities are in the app. And then you can see what is near you and what you would want to, to explore. One thing we've noticed is we have a lot of people who know a little bit about us, but they don't know everything about us. So they may go to their local park and go walk the trails or use the playgrounds, but they don't know about the other park down the road or the other amenities that some of our other parks have. So in this app, you'll be able to see based on your location, what's around you and what you're interested in. You can filter and say, I'm interested in fishing and immediately all the parks that have fishing opportunities will pop up and you can sort them and see them by what's closest to you. And you can do that with any amenity, whether it's a playground, a dog park, a splash pad, any amenity you can sort and fil filter by. If you're interested in our rec centers, we'll have information on every rec center there. Um, if you want to reserve a shelter, we still do shelter reservations. You can do that in the app. You can search availability and then actually book and pay for that shelter reservation through the app. So there's a big park section that really focuses on the amenities that we are seeing increase to bring awareness to all of our amenities. The other feature is it has all of our events and programs. We had a pre-COVID, we had a digital, uh, a, a hard copy guide that had all of our activities in it, the at your leisure guide. And we've digitized that through the app and you can now search for any activity you wanna do based on your location, based on the age of the participant, based on the subject, and you can all in one place see all of our activities 
Um, if it's a registration based activity, you can register for that activity through the app. You don't have to leave the app. If you're interested in some of our performing arts, you can purchase your tickets for a Henrico Theater show. You can purchase tickets for the Henrico Theater Company out at the Cultural Arts Center. All of that is embedded in the app, and you can do that through your phone and wherever you're at. And the last feature, which we're really excited about, is some of the interactivity and challenges that we've created in the app. Because what we've noticed is people come out to our parks and they want to do things. Pokemon Go a number of years ago was a big chant, was a big push to get people on the parks. And we now have built in and are continuing to build those same opportunities in that app. So right now we have a playground challenge up where you can go through and you can, um, the challenge is go to as many playgrounds as you can. And when you get to that playground, you can check in. And if you hit a certain number of playgrounds, you will have received your badge for the playground challenge. We'll be building more challenges as we go, but it gives you an interactive way to be able to utilize this app and it will get people going back to it, but it really leverages that that trend that we noticed that people are using technology and people are kind of glued to their cell phones. So we wanted to be on that cell phone and we wanted to create opportunities to promote our parks, promote our activities, and then engage with people through that, through that app. So again, this app is available in both the um, Apple and Android store, it's no cost, free, download it. Um, it will replace, it will tell you everything you need to know about the department, but it also helps us highlight what we're noticing is our parts are really becoming at the forefront and it's a way for us to advertise what we're doing. Um, the other, the kind of last thing I will say on, on this subject is because we're noticing this trend and decline in some of the youth sports, we're taking that into consideration in the way we design some of our parks. Um, so in future years, like Taylor Farm Park will be opening, not this year, but next year, it's, it's under the development stage. That is going to be an active park, but that park won't have ball fields. So again, we're seeing people, we're seeing youth um, wanting to get out, but it's not always, cent always centered around a ball field. So we're gonna have active play, active amenities, but not necessarily ball field amenities. So as we move forward, those are some of the things you'll see. And then we want to hear from you guys. We recently commissioned a needs assessment as a part of the county's comprehensive plan. We'll be getting that back this spring, and then we'll be encouraging, we'll be doing some of our own internal assessments to say, what do you guys want to see? So we can highlight that in our parks as we build things and as we develop programs around the amenities we have in our system, we want to hear what amenities you guys want to get to see and attend. Thank you so very much, uh, John. It was uh, insightful. And let me, there may be some persons in, who are listening who may have some questions. So one of the things I forgot to do at the beginning is talk about how you can get involved. And since we're virtual, we do have a Two ways for you to get in touch. Number one, if you want to speak during this meeting, please use the chat feature to send a message to the hosts and panelists stating you would like to speak. Please remember to enter your full name. Once it is your turn, I will call upon you in using your name. You will then be unmuted and can begin to speak. Thirdly, if you would simply like to submit your input but not speak aloud, please send your thoughts into the Q&A feature and I will be able to receive and review the questions that you have. Um, just before we go to our other presentation, John, um, two questions for me. Um, what if someone wanted this information? Where could they send it to request that? This, this, if they want the presentation, they can just send an email to me. If they want information about the app or any of those, that data, you can go to our website or the app. You just go to your Apple or Android store and you just type in Henrico Recreation and we're the first thing that pops up and you can download it straight from there. Gotcha. Very good. My second question is, you mentioned two types of recreational initiatives. Very briefly, 
give those definitions again, because a lot of people may not know these changes are taking place. So there's active, um, so youth sports, we would consider an active activity. That is an organized sport. That is where we're seeing some declining numbers, particularly in recreation based and recreation is essentially a non competitive league. That is not a travel league, not tournaments. That is just league similar to your local wise. Um, we consider that a rec league. The flip side of that is the competitive side, and that is your travel ball. That is your travel tournaments. So that's the sports side of things, but we also have active recreation. Um, that is not organized sports, and that could be things like the pump tracks that we're building. Um, we have a pump track at Deep Run. Uh, we'll have a skate park out at Taylor Farm Park. Uh, Taylor Farm will also have a pump track. So that is still an act of recreation, but it is not in a structured, competitive, or structured group environment, organized environment. It is more of an individualized activity that you can do and take advantage of on your own at any time. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Brackett, do we have any calls? Anyone has called in for any information? No, sir, not okay. right now. Thank you. Okay, well, I hope that that information was very helpful to people uh, about the challenges and needs uh, for the 21st century. Now, let's switch from that and go to something that's going to occur soon. And that is that one of the ways and we live in what's called a Dillon rule state. And therefore, if we want to know what it is that our citizens want, sometimes we have to ask for permission to do that. And one of the methods that we use is called a referendum. So the second part of our presentation will be what we will call the bond referendum. And this will be given by one of our, also one of our own, Mr. Brandon Hinton, who is the Deputy County Manager for Administration. A little bit about Mr. Hinton. Mr. Brandon Hinton began his career with Henrico County as an entry level budget analyst, watch this year now, 2003, within the Office of Management and Budget. In February of 2018, Mr. Hinton was named Deputy County Manager for Administration. Mr. Hinton has direct responsibilities over the departments of finance, general services, and information technology, as well as the public library, legislative liaison, and the manager's office support staff. So we are happy to have uh, Mr. Hinton to share with us what's coming out of the pike with the bond referendum for Henrico County. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Thornton. And um, good evening, everyone. Um, Mr. Thornton, really grateful to uh, have the opportunity to talk about the bond referendum uh, this evening. And uh, we've had many conversations on this topic. Uh, slide one. Um, and uh, last night, the board of supervisors actually had the, um, the one and only vote necessary to move this bond referendum forward. Um, and the board voted to move forward enthusiastically. So uh, we are incredibly excited to have a really busy um, 2022 ahead of us with education into the community, talking to people, um, much more information to come on this. But um, it's never too early to have a conversation about it. Uh, those of you that live uh, or lived in Henrico County and voted in 2016 may remember uh, the previous bond referendum we had where you were asked five questions uh, to uh, for us to complete a number of projects. Uh, all five of those pre uh, questions were voted in the affirmative, um, fortunately, and we have been incredibly busy as the residents of the Fairfield District know. Your beautiful new Fairfield Library came out of the 2016 referendum as well as renovations, much needed renovations to uh, Chamberlain and Adams Elementary Schools, new turf fields at all of our high schools, among many other projects. Um, as Mr. Thornton noted, um, we are required by state law to, um, in order to issue general obligation bonds, uh, we must go to a referendum. We've had quite a few of these over the years. Uh, again, last one being 2016. 
Um, and, and this is the form in which uh, we, we choose general obligation bonds as, as most uh, counties do because it's the cheapest form of debt that we can issue. Uh, and therefore, we can build large projects for the cheapest cost. So in looking at the bond referendum projects coming this fall, Henrico voters will be asked to vote on four questions this time. One question for schools projects, one for public safety projects, one for recreation and parks projects, and one for countywide drainage improvement projects. And uh, so you can see on this slide a list of those projects by category. And uh, what I've done is taken the opportunity to highlight some projects in yellow, as you see here, that either will directly be located in the Fairfield District or will directly benefit residents in the Fairfield District, so countywide projects, if you will. And we're going to discuss each of these in a little more detail going forward. Um, so you'll see if you add up all the projects that we're going to go through this evening, you have a total bond referendum in the amount of around $511 million. Um, of that amount, you'll see the schools makes up about two thirds of that at $340.5 million. Um, while $500 million is a big number, uh, we take, um, we strategically issue those bonds over multiple years. You can see on the slide here that we'll do that over a six year period to ensure utmost affordability. Uh, but you'll see um, in, in the pie chart to the left, those are the dollar amounts by, by category. Uh, in which we plan on um, on asking those questions to the voters this fall. So the school board put forward five projects that address aging schools. You'll see on this slide four rebuilds uh, and one renovation. All of these schools are 50 years old or older. Uh, you'll see Longin Elementary School, Davis, Highland Springs Elementary School. Uh, those are all rebuilds. Quaxton Middle School, also a rebuild as well as a renovation to Johnson Elementary School. Again, all of these schools are 50 years old or older. In fact, after completion of these schools, uh, per the school board, there's only one project remaining built in the 1960s or earlier that has not or will not have been rebuilt or sub substantially renovated. Uh, so we're keeping up with our schools. Unlike many of our peers, we feel like we're on the, um, on the edge and able to renovate aging facilities and doing a really good job in doing so. And that's because of bond referendums such as the one coming this fall. So on the referendum on the schools question, you also see two new elementary schools proposed. Uh, one, of course, in the Fairfield uh, Magisterial District on land already owned near the River Mill neighborhood off Route 1, and then one in the West End. Uh, this is, of course, due to existing and future capacity concerns uh, in both of those areas, you know, pre COVID elementary schools in these areas were incredibly, um, uh, they were starting to hit capacity numbers. So this is forward looking. We want to make sure that post COVID when we do see kids going back into the classroom that, um, or, or more kids going back in the classroom that we have capacity and make sure our schools are not overcrowded. And then the final project for the referendum is a really interesting project. Uh, supporting the new Verona High School Environmental Science Specialty Center. Um, and this might be the first project of its kind in a K-12 setting in the United States. Uh, it's entirely unique. You see the name living building in this title. That means it's going to produce more energy than it uses. So again, something that's in entirely unique, and you see an example of what's possible. This is a facility at Georgia Tech that was uh, recently toured by a number of folks from our Henrico school system and general government. Just to see again, an example of what's possible with something unique and an opportunity like this. So, transitioning over to public safety, we have a number of firehouse relocations and replacement projects, as well as a firehouse improvements project, which we'll talk about in a moment. Firehouse number six is currently a 5,000 square foot facility built in 1969. It was designed for 20 staff in two units and now has 34 staff in three units. And the new firehouse six would be 11,000 square feet with three bays. Firehouse number one was built in 1970, uh, also in the Fairfield Magisterial District. It was also originally designed for two units. Uh, it would actually be four bays after this project and 12,800 square feet. Firehouse 11 was built in 1964 at 4,200 square feet, which is, of course, inadequate for current operations. It will be expanded to 11,000 square feet. So again, modernizing facilities, key facilities, 
uh, and making them conducive to today's operations in the fire division. Continuing on our firehouse improvement project, you'll see four firehouses here, uh, 14, 15, 16, and 17. Each of these projects would receive some additions to these facilities and substantial renovations to again modernize these aging facilities. It would also add a dedicated PPE and decontamination room to enhance safety and cancer risk reductions, adding some additional restrooms, and again, modernizing key facilities, strategic fire stations in our community, and make sure that they can address 21st century issues and staffing needs. Uh, another very interesting project is our public safety training center. Uh, as you can see to the left, and as you can see in the community, Development trends have changed substantially from the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. We're now seeing a lot more vertical development, uh, apartments and so forth, some multifamily units. And uh, our, our training opportunities for our firefighters and police officers are fairly limited to, uh, to what those facilities offer based on old trends. So this new training center that's being proposed to the citizens would actually um, create a, um, a model that looks very similar to what you see on the left of the side. Uh, so they would be able to, uh, to model fires or model situations within existing structures, within new modern structures, and be able to, um, to have a, a greater training opportunity for public safety purposes. Uh, there's only one other facility that we're aware of in Virginia that's uh, even similar to this, and it's actually on FBI. Uh, it's the FBI's Hogan's Alley, which uh, some of you may have heard of. It also has, you know, modern storefronts and so forth for training purposes. So, uh, really, this is the first of its kind of a local government in Virginia. We're really excited about bringing this to our citizens for a vote uh, again this fall. Rounding out the public safety projects, uh, you'll see some other unique projects. You'll see an animal shelter. Um, that we're calling at the moment a no kill animal shelter. We'll be talking to citizens and talking to board members and other folks here soon to start thinking about a new name for this facility. But the reason we call it a no kill shelter is it's exactly that. It's one in which um, uh, it's, it's a safe spot. It's a um, it's a place where we are not going to be um, harming animals. In fact, it's it's quite the opposite. It provides a new opportunity for citizens to adopt animals, to, uh, to have a forward facing asset that the community could, uh, can rescue, surrender animals in a safe space. And then of course the adoption aspect of it. And then the first of our recreation in parks, and I'll uh, look over at John again, we're gonna offer up some new opportunities in a separate question in the referendum. The first of those being a new park in the three chopped area on um, uh, co-located on a piece of property uh, out in the three chopped area with the, the animal shelter. And this park would be the beginning of an athletic village uh, to include fields, restroom and concession, playground equipment, shelters, trails and parking. So, uh, and then I wanna also note that for the animal shelter going backwards, uh, the intent here is much like the Frank Thornton Aquatic Center, uh, the intent is to build a facility and have a third party operate that facility. So, again, a lot more to come on that subject, but 2 exciting projects on this piece of property. That the county has owned for some time now, Mr. Thornton, since 2008. Uh, keeping on the recreation and parks front, some improvements to deep bottom park. Uh, we would stabilize and restore the entire 650 foot shoreline of this park. Uh, the park entry road and internal park road system would be improved and parking would be reconfigured. And there's a house in the property and the underground gravel conveyor on this property that will be demolished and a large park shelter and interpretive structure would be built to tell the history of the site. The last recreation of parks project proposed for the coming referendum uh, is a continuation of the existing Tuckahoe Creek Park uh, with the ultimate goal, of course, of connecting the boardwalk that you see a piece of here. Uh, they extend that boardwalk from Patterson Avenue to Broad Street. So another $5 million would be allocated to, uh, to make that happen as part of, again, the Recreation and Parks question of the coming bond referendum. And then, uh, so a unique project, one we haven't brought forward in a very long time since I believe, sir, it was the early 80s. 
uh, was the last time we brought drainage forward for uh, for a bond referendum question. But I think citizens uh, out there, folks who are listening, understand that we have quite a bit of drainage needs in the county. Uh, in fact, Public Works has identified more than $55 million uh, worth of projects in the coming five years of drainage uh, related projects that would assist with stormwater, uh, with other runoff and, and things that cause a lot of property damage, cause damage to businesses and so forth. Um, so some of the, some examples of what's possible and, and actually uh, we'll tell the citizens we're actually looking at 50 million dollars worth of projects on the referendum uh, on a separate question. Examples of what's possible with these funds include acquisition of land. So if there's a piece of land in a floodplain, for example, that we could acquire that strategically makes sense and we can find a, a use for that's something we could uh, certainly use these funds for. Um, stream restorations, other improvements that are necessary to again address long-term needs related to uh, stormwater. As you all know, we've had a ton of rain, um, and with with climate change and other factors that are outside of our control, we expect a lot more of that to come. So this is our attempt at being proactive um, and getting involved in in some really substantial, very expensive projects that should do and will do a lot of good for the community. Uh, Mr. Thornton, citizens listening, uh, there's going to be a lot more to come on this subject. Again, we plan more than 100 meetings this summer talking to the community. Um, if you have uh, a group of folks within your community that you would like us to come talk to, please reach out to me directly. My email address is hin at henrico.us. We would love to hear from you, maybe schedule something sometime June, July or whenever, honestly, we can come out and, and talk more about this subject. But we're really excited about the prospect of, of hitting the community again, talking to people and uh, answering questions. And, and more than anything, this is all about educating our citizens and making sure they have uh, an informed vote come, uh, come this fall with the referendum. Oh. Brandon, thank you so very much for this cogent uh, piece of information and uh, this kind of is a type of thing which kind of helps uh, our citizens to kind of know what's coming down the pipe <laughs> before it happens. Uh, so uh, thank you so much for sharing that with the constituents tonight. Uh, did we have any uh, other persons? Okay, no one has written in that okay um would you repeat again uh the suggested cost absolutely sir so uh the total cost i guess is over a six-year period would be about 511 million dollars in total um and then it's spread out amongst four questions as well okay with schools with two-thirds of that being schools and how does uh this uh bond referendum how does that configure with previous ones we have far as the cost is concerned. Yes, sir. So 2016 referendum, if I, if I recall, was in the low $400 million okay. range. Okay. 2005, the one before that was in the $350 million range. Okay. So it's more. Okay. Um, and we're able to do so based on just good debt management. Um, we have a really strong finance team that manages our debt very carefully. It allows us to do things such as also our indoor sports facility okay. um, in the uh, coming in the Fairfield district as well. So, um, yes, sir, because of that, we're able to to issue a little more every time and, um, and, and manage it very well. Okay, well, thank you so very much, as I said, for that cogent information. Okay, as we do sometimes in some of these other programs, announcement time. Announcement time, all right? Um, citizen, listen up. Come to the Eastern Henrico Recreation Center for the annual Senior and Caregiver Expo. That will be held on March the 9th from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. and speak with over 50 senior care providers of all their service offerings and how you might benefit and which uh, and learn which senior services and resources will be a good fit for your situation. 
All attendees are entered to win raffle prizes. Citizens and uh, older adults, 60 and older, who live in Enrico, and their caregivers are encouraged to come to speak with representatives from the following agencies, personal care, adult day centers, government programs for seniors, seniors focused nonprofits, transportation providers, assisted living, nursing facilities, and other senior living options, and many more. Uh, you can register, and you register to the advocate for the aging at the following phone number, if you are a phone person, 804-501-5065. I'll give that number again, 804-501-5065. Or for the uh, other address is aging advocate at Henrico.us. Again, that is A G I N G A V A D V O C A T E at Henrico.us. And I think I also, if the camera can get this, there's a little, little thing here about this, I believe, Senior Expo. So, seniors. You've lived a lot of life, and this is one of the programs that the county want to have to make the rest of your lives even better. And uh, to me, that's a blessing. So don't just follow that group of service when we old is all. No, we respect it. We respect each of you. All right, as we continue tonight, Let's talk about something that's very important, how you can really be a part of this yourself. And we want to talk about, and I'll do this briefly, what I call the county boards and commissions. So um, I want to kind of give you some idea of how they are configured and what's our raison d'etre for having these boards. Um, there are certain boards, and I will mention how they are configured. They are district-based, skill-based, or at-large appointments. Uh, for district-based, we talk about uh, a board like the Board of Social Services, uh, in which there are three terms that you can have, and uh, there are usually five district appointments, okay? Then there are some skill-based boards, such as the Planning Commission, which, uh, a representative is called for one term. It can be elected over and over again. Uh, there's a member from the Board of Supervisors as a representative also, but that uh, person on the Planning Commission must also, as I did, kind of take a certified course, okay? And then we have some at-large appointments. For example, we have the Cultural Arts Center, and some of those persons um, up to 21 uh, you know, can be appointed by myself or any of my colleagues there. So as you see on the slide, uh, those are some of the types of boards that we have. Now, we have a bunch of them. I'm just going to quickly highlight just a few. Um, number one you see on the screen is the Board of Real Estate Review and Equalization. Well, you need to know about that, okay? And you see the purpose. Um, in case that you want to say, I don't agree with the assessment, this is the board that you will get in touch with. One I just mentioned, Board of Social Services, uh, very important board. I'm on that board presently. Uh, as you see, the purpose is establishing, reviewing, and revising policy decisions and discretionary power over local funding. Very critical, very critical. Again, on this board, um, uh, there's a member of the uh, Board of Supervisors. The Grievance Panel, you need to know about this. This is a board also in which persons are eligible to serve. And what's the purpose? 
to provide a prompt, fair, and orderly method for resolution of employee grievances initially aided by eligible employees of the county. So, uh, very important, I want you to know about this one. I put a little asterisk by it. The other uh, board I want to mention tonight would be the Henrico Area Mental Health and Developmental Services Board. Very important, very important. Responsibilities for the establishment and operation of all local public community mental health, intellectual disability, and substance abuse services. Very important like that. We want to let people know that we can, they can get help in these areas. Uh, some other boards that uh, I wanted to highlight tonight. Um, actually, here's one that Mr. Zanino mentioned a little bit that he's uh, attached to somewhat because it comes on the recreation parks, and that's called um, the, we, some of us call it HPAC, but as you see, this stands for Historic Preservation Advisory Committee. And each board member appoints two persons to this particular committee. And as you see, the purpose uh, is to advise the Rico County Board of Supervisors regarding the identification, interpretation, rehabilitation, and watch this word, protection and preservation of historical and cultural resources located within the county. Very important board. Keep it Rico beautiful. Um, again, that uh, title is um, endemic to what this particular uh, board does. Put a little asterisk beside that one, okay? Library Advisory Board. Well, actually, we need to have someone to help and assist the library director. And there are many things that these persons can do. And so uh, we have a library board that you see with that um purpose is to promote the utilization of library facilities to provide opportunity for citizen participation and the rest very important very important and tonight you heard specifically from a member of the parks and recreation uh it itself and there is a parks and recreation advisory commission and also each member of the board uh, points to citizens to these boards. Uh, this commission is not very old. It was created in 1976, okay? And it tells you what the purpose is there. And also the last one, I think I mentioned a few moments ago, planning commission. And what's that purpose to serve in an advisory capacity to the board of supervisors and making land use decisions and in promoting orderly, very key word, orderly development and planning for the county's infrastructure and services to support growth in the future. Very important. Okay, and you see with the next slide, we have the total number of boards. In case I didn't mention that to you before, we really have a total of 39 boards and commission. I only mentioned to you tonight though, uh, probably about 10. Um, now, uh, I did mention to put an asterisk by some of them. Well, you might say, well, Mr. Thorne, or whomever your supervisor might be, uh, I want to be, you know, a person to maybe serve on the one of those boards. Well, uh, we can pull the other slide up. The last slide, I want you to know how you can do that. Here is the number and you contact Ms. Tanya Brackett, who is our outstanding clerk to the Board of Supervisors and, you know, send your name to your number of your Board of Supervisors. Now, please be advised that many times um, there may not be a position because someone may have been placed in those positions. But from time to time, there are vacancies. I want to uh, put out a personal call for the grievance panel, grievance panel, the Fairfield District. I wish the person would make sure that you call me about that, call Ms. Brackett, and also keep it right beautiful. And uh, from time to time, these 
uh, positions. Some are for one year, some are for more than one year. But uh, please keep in touch with me to let me know your feeling about this. And some of you have done that in the past. Here again, uh, U.S. citizens become the eyes and ears for us, the supervisors. And I want to, not only for myself, but for many of my colleagues on the board, thank you for participating in some of these items here. Okay. So, again, it gives you some type of info as far as the boards and commissions that we have and what's their purposes. Now, hopefully you have a better idea about that. As we conclude tonight, um, by the way, this is called Black History Month, okay? And I'm going to talk and share with you, um, there is a word called the griot. And the griot was a person in the African culture that used to be the storyteller and was a person that told the histories of the tribe. So I want to tell you now, share with you very briefly, and I want to apologize in advance that I'm going to do it so briefly that uh, hope that you will look this up on your own and find out additional information. But in honor of Black History Month, I want to just mention a short story, and I'm going to call this A Man Named Ben Brown. Now let me give you a little information about this person. Ben Brown was born on October the 20th, 1849, and given the name Ben. He, he became a house servant. He was a slave. He spent his early childhood as a slave on a Georgia plantation. His, um, his parents were slaves who became also field slaves in Georgia, and they were from Virginia. After his first owner died, um, Ben was taken to Rome, Georgia. And that master died, and Ben was also sold again to an owner in Tennessee. And while he was there in Tennessee, he absconded and left because the Union troops were very close by, and he joined the Union Army, and he changed his name. And he changed his name to William Washington Brown, frequently referred to as W. W. Brown. A little bit of information about him, because we always like to connect everything with Enrico County. Uh, ben Brown, who's now W. W. Brown, we want to call him, um, he uh, helped set up what's called the Grand Fountain United Order of True Reformers. So I'm going to be using this word true reformers, okay? And it was set up uh, to have fraternal organizations, somewhere secret, okay? In which Negroes could become more active. Um, some of these social and uh, groups that some people never heard of, uh, these were things which helped the Negro businesses, such as insurance, okay? And let me mention insurance. Uh, during this period, I'm talking about the period of 1881, close by that, um, Brown is going to eventually come to the Richmond area. But Brown uh, noticed that many white companies would not give insurance to Negroes. So uh, Brown became a major transformer with this group called the Trans, the True Reformers. Again, had a long name, we just used True Reformers. Okay, what about W.W. W. Brown that I want you to kind of look, look up yourself and know more about? Well, first of all, his vision. Um, Brown envisioned expanded into an enterprise that cultivated a growing black middle class, offering services that included a savings bank, a real estate company, a retirement home, and a youth and children's division that taught the following, discipline, thrift, and business skills. 
Last but not least, I want to also mention to you, um, how does this connect? How does W.W. Brown's life connect with Henrico County? Okay, well, here is the following. Uh, one of the things that the true reformers tried to do in 1897 is that they purchased uh, 634 acres off of what's called uh, Kerr Street Road. And the design was to develop the old folks home for black people. And so it did not succeed. Why? Brown also died that year. He died, okay? So the initiative was not successful. But you have that Henrico tie-in. And in conclusion, just in case you ever been on Second Street, which also is called sometimes um, the Walls, the Black Wall Street of Richmond, there is a restaurant down there, very close to the theater called the Hippodrome. And this restaurant today is called the Speakeasy. So if ever you've gone and passed the Speakeasy, you need to know that there was a building that was built by the true reformers. And if you look at the architecture, totally different. And books will have it that this was said one of the most luxurious um, homes ever built for a Negro person. So we're talking about back in the 1800s. Uh, so then, W. W. Brown. One thing I did leave out is that we often give Mac and Walker the credit that she should have. But guess who had the first, one of the first African American banks in the United States? W. W. Brown. And just in case you didn't know that, he had the first chartered bank in his home at 105 West Jackson Street. And so that's not too far from here. So again, um, let me conclude with why we have one person who has a question before you close. Let's go hold on. Someone has a question before you close. Oh, a question? Okay. Do you want me to unmute them? For the uh, unmute them. Would you like for me to unmute them? Yes. Let me stop here. There is a question. It's Miss Tara Adams. Oh, for calling, okay. Adams. Good evening, Supervisor Thornton and all attendees. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Good evening. Um, so I'm on today, um, as are some of my other neighbors, um, as a result of the very, very unsightly roundabout at the end of the corner of Oak Hill Lane in Duran. My neighbors and I, who are also property owners, real estate taxpayers, and Henrico County voters are utterly disgusted, offended, and outraged by the deplorable mechanism that was assembled and placed in the middle of our residential road. That mechanism is utterly making our property values plummet. Uh, it is very hard to navigate. It is sitting in the middle of the street and it is an eyesore. We were not asked at all, surveyed, told, or our buy-in was not gained for that mechanism to be placed there. We are opposed to that mechanism. Nowhere else do we see it and we want it gone. Some other form of roundabout speed lowering interception could be considered. However, we want our feedback considered. That is not the appropriate device to be placed there. We were not, our opinions were not taken. It is not acceptable. 
and it needs to go. Okay, thank you, Ms. Adams, for your reaction and your uh, representing uh, the persons, the homeowners in your particular uh, area there. You, you did give me a call about that, and uh, let me share this with you. Uh, first of all, I appreciate uh, your sharing the information. Um, and you know, what, what happens is that sometimes we don't have all the information and, uh, and when we don't have that, that can really make things a little tough for us to understand and thinking that maybe at some point that people have not treated us right. And so once you called me about that, I went to take a look at it myself. And after having looked at it myself, I had your same opinion that uh, this was kind of horrendous. I'd never seen this. But then, too, I had not seen the pre planning of a roundabout. So uh, you did mention in your comments that nobody asked anyone about that. There were some citizens who did request some information. But let me just get to the roundabout. Uh, the roundabout is not something that, as you look at the con present configuration there, that's etched in stone. Actually, what it is, it is, that's why I'm glad that you called in. We want feedback from the community to see how we can configure it better. Now, there is a problem there, and it's the county's responsible to do, to do things better. But, uh, you know, uh, it's not going to look like those little sticks you see there. So thank you again for letting me know this. And I think what I need to have done, and you might, you don't have to, because you could be the contact person. I will have Public Works again with you to show how we do this. We have them. Also, I think I may have heard a reference to another section. We have on one of these uh, roundabouts, which is done, configured the same way, uh, in another section of our county. Uh, but that is not how it's going to end up. We want to see how the traffic will do, and probably public works, which can speak for itself, is going to configure it in the best way. So I don't want you to feel that uh, that community is being shortchanged. If I were living there, I would feel the same way if I did not know the process. So I hope that the two of us can get together and that information from all the uh, members of the community. We want to improve how it can look. Uh, but before we didn't go in and put in a uh, roundabout, we put in the steps of how it could be configured. So I appreciate how you feel about that. And maybe we're going to have to have a, maybe some meeting of the community so the community people can share with Public Works which would be the best configuration. Again, thank you for that question. Any other statements, uh, Ms. Brackett? Is that it? That is it. And I and I also told Ms. Adam she could email me. That's it? That's it. Okay. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, I end, I end and I apologize for the interruption, uh, which really was an interruption, but let me end with a couple of reflective thoughts. And this is a thought about uh, Black History Month. By the way, when I was in school, it was called uh, Negro History Month, okay? And you see today we have Negro, uh, we have Black History Month. Um, by the way, we need to know who did that, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, who was from Virginia, by the way. And uh, Negro History Month started in 1926, and it was in 1976 that it was named and switched to Black History Month. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, a reflective thought about Black History Month. And I'll take uh, one of the thoughts from 
an African poet. Um, and as African Americans respecting our African roots, let me share a term I would like that can add to Black history. And this term is a term of hope and inspiration for all people, but especially people of color. And this word is called negritude. So what is negritude? Negritude, defined by its originator, Leopold Songo, means that blackness has beauty, worth, authenticity, and pride. Another meaning is black is beautiful, or as we say in French, le noir est beau. So then let us continue to respect uh, our thoughts on black history and let black history month serve as a reminder to respect, protect and honor black lives and tell the stories that are often dismissed, overlooked and forgotten. Again, um, thank you for attending our virtual town meeting tonight. And our next one, I think, is March the 21st, maybe. But we'll let you know in time. Have a good evening and keep safe. I want to thank my presenters, John Zanino, Zanino and Brian Hinton. Thank both of them. And last but not least, we have a, a young man who works on the camera. You don't see him, but his name is Ryan Eubank. Ryan, I want to thank you. And of course, uh, the queen behind all of this is Tanya Brackett. Good night. <laughs>